Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of My Liverpool Life. I am your host, Mo Stewart, and I'm very pleased to be joined by a man who was very important to me in my childhood. He gave me some of my favourite moments in my formative years as a Liverpool fan, and one of my less favourite moments, I'm sure you can guess which one. Uh, he played for the club for, with distinction for six and a half years. He's now back within the, the club, helping them out, helping out the young players. Michael Thomas, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so, for having uh, me. You know, I like your formative years. Your formative years where you said that, your formative years. Were you alive when I was playing? <laughs> of course I was alive. I was alive. Oh, yeah. I mean... <laughs> That was the period when when Arsenal and Liverpool were battling for those titles in the late eighties, early nineties. That was when I was banging my flag to the mast. So yeah, you were a very important character on both sides of that of that oh, coin. Good. <laughs> now, <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit about the Arsenal stuff because obviously this is my Liverpool life. But you mm -hmm. had a very strong career before you arrived at us. You signed with them as a young man, uh, fifteen year olds, I think you were. They made your debut uh, in a League Cup semi against Spurs, which, you know... Right, yeah. My, my <laughs> old team I used to support is going watching the terraces. <laughs> which, which I mean, let's talk about that for a second. Like, I can't even imagine what it's like making your debut. But then to do it in such an atmosphere where those guys who, like you say, who support the same team you support, you may have even sat alongside the terraces, yeah. and they're now wanting the worst for you. That must have been such a mad scenario. It was really because I just come back from loan from Portsmouth, and at the time, I had a month there with the crazy. They, they are crazy, you know, crazy gang Wimbledon. Yeah. Wimbledon the uh, Portsmouth boys were crazy. Think of the players you know, they had there: Noel Blake, Kevin Dillon, mm -hmm. uh, Kennedy, uh, Quint Quinny, you had, um, Mick Shannon. Uh, you had so many crazy players up there. Um, so after playing first team and getting first team experience. I came back and obviously disenchanted. I just want to play for more first team football or stay there. And they wouldn't let me stay there. Arsenal, Arsenal would not let me stay there. So I came back, played a few games in reserves. Viv Anderson had been suspended, I think. So Gus Caesar went in as right back. And, and then I found out I was on the bench. So it was a bit of shock for me to come back and I'm on the bench and uh, against the team I used to go and watch, especially. Yeah. Yeah, so, sure. so were you were you nominally a right back the whole time then? Because I yeah. know throughout your Arsenal career, there were certain points where your adaptability allowed you to go and play on right side midfield or centre midfield. But at that stage in your career, you were still trying to be a right back. Yeah, well, I played for English schoolboys at right back and left back. That's how that's how Arsenal spotted me playing um, on an England schoolboy trial when I was fourteen. So I was playing the fullback. So that's how it started. It's interesting to think now, like when you when you think about the way the fullback game goes, and obviously we've got someone like Trent who's kind of done it. Well, there's lots of talk about him eventually moving into midfield. It's a very different world compared to what it was like when you were trying to play that position. Yeah, very much so. But you know, you know, I always laugh when you hear the, the, um, the commentators or people on TV and saying, "Oh, this right back is a different. Oh, it's a new breed now playing right back," and they and like. They're getting forward more and not defend. I'm like, hold on, we've done that in the old days. We've done the whole thing. The only thing we didn't do is do right foot crosses across the pitch like Trent did. <laughs> and a wing and scoring goals, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing. It just it just wasn't spoken about there because, you know, it wasn't quite as, as, as fancy. But obviously, like I say, throughout your career at Arsenal, you came through with there was a, a really good crop of youngsters who all kind of came through at the same time. You were very successful, as I mentioned. You won the league in 1989, yes, I know, and in 91. Uh, both times with Liverpool, Pippin Liverpool to the trophy. You had the League Cup win in 87, which was also Pippin Liverpool to the trophy. <laughs> all right, and, then, <laughs> and then you decided to join <laughs> Liverpool like at that point. <laughs> So let's talk about the full process. Like when 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 it was clear that Liverpool were interested in you, like you know, you knew they were a good team. Obviously, like oh, I right said, you've been battling the big for the big trophies these last four years. But was there any trepidation on your part because of the recent history? Let's call it. Um, not really, because if I, I was thinking about if I go back there, go to Liverpool, I want to win a trophy. I want obviously, obviously, I denied them the league, and I want to win them the league. Um, but I didn't want to come in in Christmas time. You see. 
I spoke mm. to Graham about that. I wanted to go when my contract was up at, in the summer, let it go to tribunal, you know. So that was well, where, that's where I, my head was at. It is interesting. I mean, I wasn't here in 1991, so I imagine the city's changed quite a lot. But yeah. you arrived, like you say, in Liverpool just before Christmas 91. What kind of city did you find when you came here? How was the settling in process? And, like, how important were some of the guys in the dressing room you might have known previously within all of that? Oh, no, the, the city was totally changed. As obviously, now it's through really modernised. You can't think about the past when I first arrived here. I lived in the Malt House. Um, that was now John Lewis's. Uh, I lived there for only six months. <laughs> um, uh, Mark Waters helped me around, and Charlie C, the DJ, and John Barnes was a big inf influence on me, mm -hmm. as well as Ian Rush. You know, so I just sort of like settled down very quickly. Um, I just couldn't find a house, and I think the one thing I did notice when I first arrived here, living in, living in the hotel and walking, I'm basically in the city, that I mm -hmm. couldn't find any black faces when I walked in in town. It was weird for me to see that. I was like, wow, where, where, is, where is everybody? You know, that, as I come from London, where everybody, mm -hmm. you know, different, you know, colour cultures, you know, it's, it's weird. All those, I just saw white faces and didn't see any black faces that is going anywhere and in the shops. So it was like, wow. It's, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, that's the thing, isn't it? It's when you go to somewhere that's within the same country, you don't think you're going to see such a stark difference. But yeah. when I, I mean, I had similar situation when I, I moved here in what, 2004. And by that time it had begun to change. You had the capital of culture start mm. to come in. So the city was more aware of trying to draw in a more diverse crowd. But yeah. I mean, did you find that that had any hindrance with you within the team set up? Obviously, the team when you arrived, Graham Souness, it was there was a little bit of turmoil already because of obviously the Kenny situation that just happened. Did yeah, you, like yeah. well, obviously hearing about all the older players, more than about obviously Graham Souness at the time, how he made the club very unsettled in the way that he tried to change things so quickly mm -hmm. and or get rid of all the older players. And and for me, when I came, I thought I was going to be. I learned off the older players because I've obviously we're uh, in depth watching Liverpool throughout their history. And when they bought someone, they always make sure to get I'd played in the reserves, learn the craft mm. before they moved into the first team. So I thought I'd be learning under Steve McMahon and um, Rick and Ronnie Whelan, players alike. So when I got sort of blooded straight in, and obviously Steve McMahon went straight away, uh, it was quite a shock for me, really, in that respect. Yeah, I can imagine. But, I mean, obviously a big part in helping you settle would have been the goal in the 92 Cup final. We have to mention that goal. <laughs> I I mean, I, I vividly remember my celebrations. I'm not sure how much you remember of your celebrations in the post. I remember very well. Remember very well. <laughs> <laughs> well I'm, I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to hear. Okay, so, so to take us inside then. Like, what was it like in the post-match after that game then? Uh, after the game or before the game? Oh, well, the whole day then? The whole, the whole day. day. The whole day. I'm, I'm, even now, I try to rec recollect recollect the... I just remember going up Wembley Way and a sea of Liverpool fans everywhere. It's it fantastic. And I'm, wear, I'm wearing the red shirt of Liverpool, so it's great for me. But I know the pressure is on because we're playing Sunderland. We have to win. Yes. Win, win well because we just about got through after playing against Portsmouth mm. in the replay. So we didn't really play that well. So we had to make sure this game was a proper Liverpool team playing properly. Um, and the build-up was quite calm because a lot of players have been there before, you know, mm -hmm. for a final. I've only had a league, two League Cups previously, so I'm not used to an FA Cup final. So it's very calm in the dressing room, just like a normal game for the rest of the players who, who are playing. Um, but I, I love the walk out of Wembley because it's like, like a hill and a crescendo of noise and you you could hear it and there's this little white in the tunnel which just little opens up to when you walk up the tunnel, you then you see the, the crowd in the so far away as in Sunderland Sports so far away and you can hear them hmm. once you come through the top, come out the tunnel and you hear the noise, it's fantastic and you hear the behind you, the Liverpool Sports behind you the shouting and you know screaming you know your name and whatever so and so but it's just 
all I kept thinking as a kid, one day I want to do that. I want to do that long walk in the FA Cup final. The whole world's watching you. I want to do it. I want to do it. I'm doing it now. Looking at it. And all my family are there. I'm looking to see where they are on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mum, dad said, ah, oh, it's just, it's amazing. It was just amazing. And then to score a goal like that, I mean, is that the best goal you've ever scored? Do you think? Oh, without, without doubt, without doubt. Because um, that's what I've always dreamed of. You know, I, I, people was asking to this day, which goal would you prefer? And I said, I never, I never dreamt of scoring in the, in the winning the league. I've always yeah. dreamt of scoring in the FA Cup final. And then they can't but understand that. And I say to them, think about it. European Cup was a big cup in our day, but the FA Cup was the biggest cup because the yeah. whole world was seeing it. The whole world was watching the FA Cup. So I'm on, the, I'm on the big stage here and my family, as I said, my family's there. When I scored, I where I ran over, I knew where my family was. That's where they were. Yeah. I went to them. So that, that was... That was amazing. That was, yeah. and th th those are the kind of memories that, like you say, that will always kind of yeah. stick with you throughout your career. Now, yeah. obviously, when um, Roy Evans came in, the team changed slightly, got a bit more younger, got to another couple of finals again in the 95, 96. But obviously, by that point in your career, injuries have started to make a bit more of a damaging impact. And so you were involved in those cup runs, but that wasn't necessarily re reflected in those final games. I think mm -hmm. 96, you, you kind of came off the bench after Cantona scores. And, Five you know, <laughs> which is, I mean, I must admit, I felt for you, because I, again, I remember that game vividly. Oh. And I knew when that goal went in that that was it. And I felt like everybody knew what, that, that was it. And then you were there to say, OK, come on and make an impact. Uh, how was you feeling at that point? I think it was like, I've got five minutes. I wasn't doing five minutes. You know, you know, you know people say you can score anything in, in a, score in a minute. But five minutes, we knew we didn't play well. He could, uh, he could, have, changed, he could have changed it much, much earlier. Um, Rushi came on in the second half because Stan didn't turn up or whatever. You know, we didn't play well. Honestly, we didn't play well, but we should have made changes earlier, you know. But, I mean, yeah. how, do you, how do you look back on that team in general? Because there were so many fantastic performances in that era and there were so many fantastic players. We think, obviously think about the 4-3 mm -hmm. Newcastle games yeah. and all those kind of things, but it wasn't really reflected in the trophy cabinet. Like, we've seen some of the other players of that era talk about underachievement and what you could have done. How do you feel about it? Uh, yeah, I, I agree that we were underachievers, but I loved playing in that team. Um, mm. it, it brought me back to my youth of playing, just enjoy playing football. Yeah. You know, a pass and move is a Liverpool groove. That was, we've done that in one touch, one touch, two touch football. No one could, no one could live with us when we were on our day. Even United, whenever we played United, we boss them. You know, so for me, I didn't see another team that could live with us, but we were, we were our own downfall. We didn't, you know, work hard enough, to be honest, as a team and to work on the training pitch, that to have that mentality to win leagues. It's mm. only, it was only me and John Barnes, I think, looking at it now, had won a league title. When you think about it, only us two of us. <clears throat> and we knew what the mentality it was to win it. You get to be on it all the time. Yeah, I mean, I want to talk a little bit more about John as well, because... By this point, when he was your partner in central midfield, he was playing a very different game to what he was when he first broke into everyone's consciousness. Like, how how did it feel to play alongside him? I mean, I imagine, like, training must have been so much fun as well. But even as his body is slowing down, his mind is still as sharp as ever. And, like, how must that have been to play alongside him, just have him... Oh, it was amazing, year? mate. It was amazing to play with John Barnes next, next to you. And against sometimes against you. I remember playing my making my proper Arsenal career as a right back and had to mark him when he just signed for Liverpool when they beat us 2 1 uh, <laughs> at Highbury. Stephen Nichols headed goal and I was mm. marking John Barnes and how tough that was. You know, I was like, Phew. and to play with him is a, is a pleasure and a dream. Mm. There's so many great players that I played with. John was ridiculous. Ridiculous. Stephen Manaman was another one. Mm -hmm. You know, Robbie Fowler. Oh, incredible. You know, there's so many great players. Ronnie Whelan. I love playing Ronnie Whelan. And, you know, he doesn't get the credit that mm -hmm. he deserves from, from Liverpool supporters. Because he was, even Johnny said, John, Ronnie Whelan was the one who made everything tick for Liverpool. Mm -hmm. 
All right, Steve McMahon got all the headlines, but Ronnie Whelan was the one get, get them going. Yeah. So, and and those are the kind of characters you need, like you said before about that title winning mentality. The people yeah. who can keep everyone on the straight and narrow at all points. That's that's kind of what you need in a squad. So, someone like Ronnie, I think when you come into there are other more flashy players in the team, but like you say, those kind of guys are important when it comes to winning things. Oh, without doubt. You know, we we obviously hear about Roy Keane and Graham Sinners on the TV talk about their days and having to go at each other, getting each other going. I remember playing against McMahon and Whelan and Whelan and them two used to have a proper scrap on the pitch, having to go at each other, controlling each other, everything. And uh, I should look at my <laughs> Paul Davis and Winger. Yeah, heard these two. Well, they are, they're teammates. They were going at it. But that's the, that's the, they both wanted to win, the will to win. Mm-hmm. And if he wasn't doing his job, they ever got him. And it's just like it was. You know? That's how it's, that's, that's, those are the standards that need to be upheld. So, yeah, but don't people take it personally. But, you know, later on, people took it personally. And, you know, when it's on the pitch, they keep it on the pitch. And that's it. When you leave mm-hmm. the stadium, it's gone. It should be gone. And that's how it should be gone. I think so. And yeah. obviously, when you're in a dressing room, there are certain things that, are the, the way they are that wouldn't feel the same outside. It's a very yeah. distinct ecosystem. I mean, when it came to the end of your career, let's fast forward a little bit now. When you you retired and you're moving back to Liverpool to the Liverpool area, I mean, what was it that was really that drew you back? Was it, I mean, family considerations, or was it just a, a love for being in and around a football city like Liverpool? No, family considerations definitely. My wife's from the north, so she's. Uh... Born a mank, but lived a life in Leeds. So she's got twisted blood. I was telling her, <laughs> blood. So yeah, and my son was just been, uh, been born here, but one two years old. So that was the thing. It settled. I was settled in the village where I was, and that was mm-hmm. it. And I loved where I lived. I had the sea. I got country air. I can walk around. No, no hassles. And I loved it. You know, so. Well, were you, were you in and around the city during the treble uh, the treble season? Or oh you... yeah, yeah, definitely was, was around the city. I was basically around the area just drinking. Yeah, it was great. It was a fantastic achievement. Well, I was going to say that must have been quite special for you as well because obviously some of your former teammates were still in that team, the likes of like Robbie and uh, Jamie Carragher and stuff like that. So you you must have been able to know exactly what it took for those guys. Oh yeah, you, you need a lot of luck and. You know, have a belief in that you could win everything. You know, you could do those things. But obviously, the big one's always the the one, the league. Doesn't matter what everybody else says. You know, you swap the, all that, all of them trophies for one league win. One <laughs> in that league. That does, you know, people say, "Oh, but it's your Champions League." No, oh, we want the league. We want to get back right into. You know, United are going through it now. What we're going through. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. You know, we can win other trophies, but the league is the one, the bread and butter. Yeah. That you're the top dog in your country. It feels a lot better saying that, knowing that we have done it recently as well, rather than it just being some yeah. mythical thing in the future that we can never attain. <laughs> it is. It is. It's like, come, oh, we've done it. Now move on to the next. Let's get on to the next one. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Okay, so moving on to the next one, taking that as an example, uh, let's talk a bit a little about what you were doing post your career. So let's talk about the, the Phoenix group that you set up Oh, the yeah. former guys. So. There's a few players and you know people who are who are in finance and other stuff. We want we want to help younger players in Phoenix Sports Media. We just wanted to out out coming up the next generation, not go mm. through all kinds of things, uh, financial grooming. So it, as you know, as is what we're going through right now, um, and to make them be aware. Of their, you know, obviously they're starting, they're starting on their, their journey, but make yes. sure they protect all the, their assets. So we're trying to help the next generation in that percent, in that sense. And then the ones who need come to the end of their career, we're trying to help them go into other fields, as in the tech world, because they've got great skills being part of team teamwork. So they know how to work our teams work, and they've mm. got. But people forget they've been through it all their lives, so they know how the team works. They can talk to people, and and uh, basically do well in the in the tech industry. And that's an interesting way of looking at it, though, isn't it? Because it's not just about when you finish your football career, you're looking for a way to chase the high of what you found, or even the camaraderie. Sometimes it's about 
not knowing how the skills you already have can translate to other worlds because all you know is football. Exactly. And I, I was I'm one of them. I was, just, I was, I was lost for a bit, mm. you know, very lost. And then we started all this with Phoenix Sports Media and it, it sort of re, rejuvenated me. Mm. And and from then on, I started, met Alex Inglethorpe and he asked me what I was doing. And from then he liked what I was doing. And about a couple of months, a few months later, he said, I want you back at the academy. I want you in the academy. I like what you're the game with this, or you know how you you like to help the youngsters. So and I, I've noticed you said as well that specifically you haven't really wanted to be a coach, more just a mentor to these kids. And are there things that you can say and talk about a bit easier from that perspective? Because as a coach, whether you, you have good relationships, but you're still effectively in charge, or whether this guy makes it or not, whereas you giving advice from an outside source. It's very much like you're just giving it to try and help these guys grow as men as well as footballers. Exactly. And for me, I love that the coaches have embraced me and just said to me, step in whenever you want to step in. I was going to talk to an individual, go and talk to an individual. Because I can see things sometimes that they can't see. And I can mm -hmm. say, he needs something. He shouldn't be... You know, he's playing in that position. He'd be better in another position. And and like and so alike, and or I could say something wrong with him. You know, I don't seem like there's there's you know I don't think he's the same person today. Or he needs to have a word. I just need to have a word of him. So I, I mean, mental health and well being are really important. I think mm. it's something that we as a society are beginning to wake up to, but particularly amongst kids of that age, where there are the pressures that you're not naturally used to experiencing at that age. So. I think it was part of the stuff that you've been doing with the club uh, as Phoenix. You've been mm -hmm. opening your doors to former academy players who've fallen out of the system. Yeah. How important was it to you to be able to reach out to those kids as well as the ones who are already oh, in the building? Oh, it meant so much because I'm, I'm doing something to help other people. And that's what I want to do. I want to keep on doing that. You know? Um, well, it, it's, I, it's, keep it's, the kids, I keep telling the kids, you know, education, education, education. Just do make sure, and then you know, I bang on about it, even to my son. But the kids like, yeah, but I'm playing PlayStation. I said, you're, like, you're playing PlayStation. All right, you like your PlayStation. Why did Why didn't you just build the program? Yes. You know, why not just play it? Just build it. Build something. You know, if you can do that. But all this, you've got all this time doing nothing. Mm. But, yeah. Well, that that's almost a dangerous thing for young footballers, isn't it? Having the time, because if you think about the once you get into the the schedule of training or what have you, a lot of the time you've got a whole afternoon to yourself. You do have a lot in a lot of cases you've got more money than you're used to having. So you know, idle time can come into these things and and create dangerous situations. I mean, obviously, it's a different world to when you were coming through at Arsenal, but. When you have things like social media and just like the, even just internet betting or the amount of things that someone can get into from their own hand, it, it's yeah. a very different world and you've got to try and work out how to navigate these kids through this minefield. Oh, very much so. Remember when I was younger, you could never go into a betting shop when you were young. <laughs> it's crazy. So yeah, I feel for him. I really feel for him. It's really tough for him these days. It's everything... Everything's here, a, a, a push of a button, you mm -hmm. know. And so, um, just hope that, you know, they can stay clear of all the dangers, what's around. And I like the fact that you've got a lot of the former players who are leading these courses as well, because I find sometimes it's, it's difficult to, um, to relate to youth. I mean, I'm only in my 40s. Uh, sometimes I have to try and DJ to uh, teenage kids, and I don't know what the hell they want. So, <laughs> but players who've been through it, so they can say, I've been sat where you are now. I felt yeah. like you felt now. That's yeah. such a big help in trying to help these kids uh, relate to them. Yeah, but it's been, it has been fantastic. I have to thank Liverpool FC, Phil Roscoe, Caitlin, um, Ted, who embraced us and to, you know, and hopefully do more future things with the, with the player, former players. Um, mm. for, for me, we've just put one player from Norwich, who's, who got released into a, a great position in the tech world, you know, so, and so young, just got released. So there's plenty of jobs out there for mm. everyone, not just the sportsmen and women, everyone, older people as well. My friend, um, 
jeez. Uh, Annex, I forgot the surname. She just got an MBE for getting diversity, changing diversity in the tech world. So oh, she cool. wants to get uh, uh, educate more older people into the tech world because there's more some there's millions and millions of jobs that no one's mm -hmm. doing that no one knows about. So. And and the, some of these older people are probably quite scared or put off yeah. by the tech world because they feel like they didn't grow up with it, they don't know it. But again, it's about finding the skills you have and translating them to a new world, isn't it? Exactly, and there's, there's training there, you know, there to if you want it, it's training there for you, you know, and it's plenty of jobs. So, while we're on that subject, where if anyone is interested in watching this, where can they find out more about that? Uh, let me get to my phone because I've not was a it just came out of nowhere. You said that and it's killed me, but <laughs> well, you know, I'm trying to help the people, Michael. That's what we're in it for. We're helping the people here, okay? Okay, I hear you, I hear you. I'm like, ah, geez, he's, he's got me. <laughs> All right, well, in oh. the meantime, I'll ask you something else then. So, in the meantime, we've all seen how impressive some of the current youngsters at Liverpool have been. I mean, literally the last game we saw Kai Gordon bursting onto the scene with his first goal for the club. How impressed have you been with this current crop? I mean, I, without wanting to put too much pressure on them, obviously, but, I mean, how good do you think they can be? They can be anything they want. Tyler Morton's been great, settled in. Get more games on the belt, the better he gets. Mm -hmm. Kay Gordon, as soon as we, I first saw him last season, we bought him from Derby. He, what a player. You know, he had no fear. He didn't care who he was playing against. And I love that. Um, and there's just a few more players who are waiting in the back, in the, <laughs> waiting in the, uh, in the line to get in the first team. There's too many. And, and if, even from the tens and nines all the way up, We've got mm -hmm. so many great individual players coming through, and that's a testament to the academy what Alex has, uh, Alex Singerfort has done there. It really is. And one of the things that I'm always impressed by is the composure of these kids. Like, I mean, Kai Gordon's finish is one thing, but just the way that they've been able to adapt to it. I mean, we think about the young lads, um, Tyler and Max Waltman playing in the San Siro. And yes, you can say it's a game that Liverpool absolutely didn't have to win, but it's Liverpool playing against AC Milan in the San Siro. And you never felt watching them that that was in their minds. They were just out there playing their football. And that's really not as easy as it looks. No, it isn't. But that's a testament, as I said before, it's a testament to all the academy staff who've made it that way, made it easy for them to relax more in the, in the game. That's what we try and tell the youngsters from from eight and nine, just relax on the ball, enjoy your football, enjoy the ball. You know, I had, I had one parent from another team who, who said his son was eight years old and he we were playing against him uh, and the older team and his son was eight and he saw me in my tracksuit and he went, you Liverpool? I said, yes. I go, my son was at Liverpool and he said, it's, it's too tough. They're hard, they tackle hard. Eight and they've no, they have no awareness of positioning. I went, how old's your boy? Seven. I said, tell me, if you came to the stadium, would you want to watch a player play in a rigid way or would you want to see a player play flair and get you off your seat and just go and do something? He went, I'd like to see someone get me off my feet. Well, that's what we're paying. That's what we're trying to do with play, young players. Give them time to enjoy the football. Don't tie them down to a position yet. Let them enjoy it. And that is it. That's why they're here. There's so many players coming through. You know, and it's why they've all got a big smile on their face every time you see them on the pitch. I, I, I it's, one, it's one of my favourite things about watching our team at the moment is that everybody seems to be so enjoying of it. So, have you found what you were looking for? The details. Oh, um, well, PSM. You got we got the PSM group. Okay, you can. Pearson Group UK, but then for adults, entrepreneur advocate for DNI and tech for good, and it Joseph MBE MBE, kind of so. So yeah, um, I might have to pass it to you because yeah, still got me, you got me on that one. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> hey, when I said I have to attach that to the what's the name of this <laughs> podcast, <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll 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 make sure we get some of that info in 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 um yeah. in all of the info down the, below the video. Don't worry. Yeah. Now before I let you go, we can't 
pass up the opportunity to talk about the League Cup semi-final coming up, Liverpool Ooh. against Arsenal. Now, I'm not, I mean, I know that you've said this is still technically, you know, yes. two allegiances and when it's one team's at home, that's who you normally support. Yeah. But when the trophy's on the line... I'm not supporting no one at the moment. Just <laughs> supporting no one. I can't. <laughs> it's like wife versus your family. What you gonna do? Don't get involved. <laughs> hey, look, you're a smarter man than I. I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try, I'm not, I'm not gonna try and bait you into saying something that's gonna upset no. people. But what I would say is that I'm sure you agree. Whoever wins this semi final needs to go on and win the trophy. Oh, right, that we want that. We want that to happen definitely. Um, yeah, let's please. Yes, yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, what, let's see what team Arsenal turn up with this time because after the weekend they had it wasn't a good you know. no no they looked they looked they looked invisible and it wasn't just Very because they were so. wearing those white shirts it wasn't invisible there was no spirit no fight they had nothing I was very surprised mm. well from a selfish point of view I'm hoping they turn up with that same fight <laughs> on Thursday but Michael, it's been so much fun talking to you through your Liverpool life. And I really, really look forward to seeing the fruits of your labours with the club and with these young kids. Well done for doing all that. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, there's plenty more players coming through. Don't worry, there's plenty more. And we'll be talking about them on the LFC Academy show. But until Yay! then, <laughs> thank you all for coming and watching us. See you oh, again next time. Take care.